for joining us today. And this is Brandon Adunyu Bordeaux. We're here today to do a presentation on S3, the Indian Act amendments and the potential impacts that it could have on Gahnawage. Uh, as many of you know, I've been the membership portfolio chief uh, for about six years now. And S3 is the most recent, uh, what we view as um, I guess an attack on our ability to exercise our rights as the Ginyagahaga of Ganawage and identifying who our people are. So with that, uh, Brandon and myself are gonna go through this presentation and uh, hopefully people will understand better the difference between membership, citizenship, and Indian registration under the Indian Act. Yeah, so that's part of uh, our, our uh, objectives is to educate the community of Gahnawage on differences between citizenship, uh, membership, as well as uh, Indian registration. Particular section six and section 11 of the Indian Act uh, legislation, undermining community membership control. Get used to hearing section six and section 11 a lot because you will hear that a lot throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. We'd like to also facilitate discussion and dialogue regarding the threat and risk of federal legislation and registration uh, and membership as well. So an example, Bill S3. And also we'd like to develop a community strategy and or plan to counter Bill S3. So let's look really briefly at the differences between citizenship, membership, and Indian registration. Citizenship is the status of a person recognized under the custom or law as being a legal member of a sovereign state or belonging to a nation. Uh, membership is the status of a person recognized under a law or custom as uh, being a member of a First Nation and or community. So we have the KKR here in uh, Gahnawage. Indian registration, that is the registration, uh, that's how Canada defines who is uh, an Indian. So they are, its registration is the status of a person registered and recognized by Canada as a status Indian under the Indian Act in which Bill S3 will ride, widen the criteria of uh, Indian Act and who is eligible to be a uh, status Indian quite significantly through passing Bill S3. So I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail into the three concepts. So as we understand citizenship, it is the authority over citizenship belongs to the collective or more importantly to the Haudenosaunee. Uh, in 1991, the Grand Council had put together a draft position paper known as the Eight Points of Jurisdiction and they identified membership as one of the points of jurisdiction. But I think because the terminology of membership and citizenship gets used so um, interchangeably uh, that there was some confusion Fusion. So I think we know that uh, the nation and the uh, jurisdiction of citizenship falls with under the realm of, of the nation and the Confederacy. However, the focus that we're going to be talking about is the response to this federal legislation, because for us... Um, to respond to matters related to membership and Indian registration and to do so in a matter that respects and doesn't infringe upon the rights of the nation or the collective over citizenship. So we just want to carve out the difference and the distinction between the three concepts. So moving along to membership, it's pursuant to a community custom or law who determines who is a member. We know this terminology of membership comes out of the Indian Act, so we're trying to move away from this terminology altogether. Uh, the scope of it is it's a local or community with intrinsic links to programs and services. So in our community, for example, uh, water and sewer, health prevention programs, housing, social programs, land allotments, and residency are all components of those who are recognized as being Ganyagahaga of Ganawage and who are on the KKR. We'll move ahead to registration. So uh, Indian registration by federal Indian Registrar by Indian Act criteria. So that's who Canada defines as being a status Indian. Uh, so the federal under the federal registry, the Indian Act is uh, section six. There we go with that term once again. Legally, they have interest in land claims and grievances. So this is everyone under this new Bill S3. Uh, the governance, the right to elect leadership, which in Gahnawage they do not. Then they're not eligible to vote for who can hold office at uh, Mohawk Council of Gahnawage. Because we do have a custom code on election. Yep, we do have a, a custom code. And uh, residency as well, so an absence of a community residency law. 
They would also have this would also have impacts on membership and citizenship. So legal interests in lands is something they would have a right to, according to Canada. So reserve lands, claims and grievances, as well as traditional territories. So that's what becomes problematic for us in our community is because we assert that we control our list and who we recognize mm -hmm. as our people. Canada has their registration list and who they recognize as a status Indian. And with that comes all these entitlements that, you know, becomes at odds with one another because, you know, allowing people to have legal interests in lands that, you know, don't meet our criteria, but meet Canada's criteria that is being opened up much wider as a result of these bills. And I guess we'll go into the history and the evolution of all of these um, acts or bills that have been, you know, with the sole intent of trying to assimilate Ungwe Hunwe people into mainstream Canadian society. So colonial acts since the 1850s, as we know, Canada passed the Indian Act in 1876, and it's been amended many times through the years. And the Indian Registry was established in 1951. And basically what happened was the Indian agent at that time would use their list, treaty pay list, to establish the registration list at that time uh, for Ganawage. And we know registration was petrilineal. Uh, Indian status uh, was passed through the male line to their children. And that's where there was the break within Indian women who married non-Native men lost their status. And then the non-Indian women who married Native men acquired status and as did their children. So there was also enfranchisement sections for individuals or even families. Mm -hmm. You know, a head of a household could say, you know, I'm... I'm enfranchising my family, my wife and their children. So there was voluntary and then there was also involuntary. And also a whole band could lose status and they removed all of that when they passed um, C-31 in 1985. Yeah, enfranchisement really worked in a way where it was voluntary in the 1850s, but then it was enforced back in 1876 when the act was uh, passed. So not only would a, non, uh, a native woman who married a non-native status man lost their status, because remember, you could be Native American and you don't have recognized status mm. up in Canada. What would happen is if you were in the armed forces, you would lose your status. If you wanted to become a doctor or a lawyer or a professional, you would lose your status. If you lived off the reserve for five years, there are so many different ways in which you could lose uh, your status and become enfranchised. So now we're going to talk about uh, the Indian Act in Section 6. So what happened was Bill C-31 was passed in 1985. The Indian Act was uh, divided into two main sections with 6.1 and 6.2. 6.1A was uh, existing members of a band. 6.1B was members of new bands. 6.1C was reinstated members, so mainly women and children who previously lost their status. Uh, 61D was for members who were involuntarily enfranchised. 61E was for members who voluntarily enfranchised. 61F was for children or a child born after 1985 of two registered Indians. 62 was a child born after 1985 of one registered Indian. So this was the first time Section 6 came to be under the Indian Act, and it set out all the different ways that someone could be registered uh, to get Indian status. So this is the section that has been evolving uh, with all the latest bills, C-31, C-3, and now S-3, which we're going to get into more detail. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the difference between 6.1 and 6.2. So since 1985, there are now two main categories as mentioned, 6-1 and 6-2. 6-1 status, Indians could pass status on to the children, whereas 6-2 can only pass status to children if the other parent of the child is also a status Indian. 6-2 is also known as that second generation cutoff. And within the federal registration, a registered Indian is assigned to an affiliated band and then assigned a registration number with the band designation. So in Gahnawagi, for example, it's 070. And what's being proposed in the new S3 amendments is that that second generation cut off. So let's say it's someone who married out and then that child married out. There was a, a stoppage at that point. That status couldn't be continued. Mm -hmm. um, but what S3 is a proposal of the removal of the second generation cut off so that status can be continual. It doesn't look at whether or not somebody married in or married out which again, what we see is problematic. So again, going into a little bit more detail and you know having a visual. So now we'll delve into with 
at least a chart that shows, you know, how registration works in terms of your status. So somebody who is a 6-1 who has a child with someone else who's a 6-1, the child is assigned a 6-1 uh, status and they could also pass it on to their children. A 6-1 who has a child with a non-status, that child becomes a 6-2 and the only way they can pass status to their children is if the partner or the other um, parent is also status. Uh, the next one, a 6-1 and a 6-2 makes a 6-1 child and they could pass status to their children. Someone who is a 6-2 and a 6-2 starts the process all over and they get a 6-1 designation and can pass status to children. Um, but someone who is a 6-2 who has a child with someone non-status who could, for an example, be a Ungwe Hungwe from the United States who isn't recognized as a status Indian would not have status uh, as an Indian under the Indian Act. So looking back at uh, an ever-evolving legislation, we all know about Bill C-31, which was passed in 1985. Uh, amendments were addressed uh, for the women who lost status and their children as well who were ineligible for status, so that's the first generation. Uh, Bill C-3 was passed in 2011 as a result of uh, Sharon McIver, who uh, went to the uh, federal, uh, federal Court of Canada. And uh, amendments addressed grandchildren, so the second generation of women who were ineligible for status. And now Bill S-3 passed initially in December of 2017, phase one. Amendments addressing great-grandchildren, so the third generation of women who were ineligible for status. And there's also delayed amendments for 61A all the way. As we talked about in a previous sl slide, 61A is at this point for anyone that was uh, born of two registered Indians prior to 1985. Well, this looks at recategorizing everybody and placing them into 61A as long as they were born before 1985 and they go back to 1869 with the Gradual Enfranchisement Act. So they will all be 6-1s and they could all pass this status onto their children. So with, so with regard to that, I mean, we look at this and say, you know, we know there was discrimination in the Indian Act, that it was all paternal and us being from a metrilineal society, how it broke that line. But what we tried to petition the federal government when they were making these amendments is that you can't rectify the wrongs of the past with making everybody status. There is like, permanent damage already done because of that. Exactly. So now, you know, the third generation of women who had married out, it doesn't consider, you know, whether they had grew up in the community, had any connection to, you know, their culture, their language, um, and it just assigns everybody, you know, status. Of course, we understand that they need to apply, but the numbers become pretty staggering, uh, and that's what we're going to get into a little bit later. So we just wanted to show the fact that there's been three times now since Bill C-31 that that Section 6 and the criteria of who could be registered as a status Indian under the Indian Act has evolved and changed to now including a uh, third generation of women uh, who had lost their status and proposing to go all the way back to 1869 of anybody who had ever uh, enfranchised. So, yeah, it's going to be a lot. So let's take a look now at the links between Indian status and band membership. So section 10, that sets out the scope and process for transfer of control of the band, uh, the band list or membership by a band. It requires community consent and taking in of members registered to the band at the time of the transfer, including those with acquired rights. And acquired rights is not just any non-native woman who married a native man uh, prior to 1985. Canada now applies acquired rights to anyone who gained status tied to a band. This is uh, not us, Gahnawage. We're not under Section 10. We would be classified as being under Section 11, which sets out the band list and membership for bands that have not taken over control of their own respective band list. So in Canada's eyes, their list is the actual list of Gahnawage, not ours. And if a band is Section 11, then the Section 6 registration list is the Section 11 list. I know this is a little bit... Um probably confusing for people, um, but this specific sections also came out in 
uh, C-31 in 1985, and as you said, Section 10 set out the opportunity for bands to take control of membership. What happened at that time was Gunawage had already started to implement membership rules in the community. We know we had the 1981 moratorium in effect at that time, and in 1984 we had the Mohawk Law. So when Bill C-31 came out, we had the opportunity at that time to submit our law to the, the minister uh, to get approval for our law to, I guess, be seen as uh, legal or acceptable in their eyes, which the community at that time was pretty principled, saying, we don't need Canada's blessing. We're going to do this. It's important for our future generations and for you know self-determination. And with regard to requiring uh, a community consent of taking in those acquired uh, rights people, the community wasn't ready for that at that time. It was, you know, it was still contentious in the community. And in terms of the process, we would have to have a double majority vote. So think about at that time in the community, you would have to have 50% of the electors and 50% of those electors would have to agree to this taking over. So we knew it was never going to fly. So we just asserted our way of doing things and have always maintained that our list is the list for Gunawage. Whereas Canada will say, no, you're a Section 11, you've never taken over control. And anybody that we register as a status Indian under, whether it be Bill C-31, C-3, or now S-3, is who we consider Mohawks of Gunawage. So that's why there's a, um, a discrepancy population yeah. that's been growing, and I think we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. In terms of um, Bill S3, so let's talk about specifically how this came to be. In 2015, the Deschano decision, this came out of the um, Quebec uh, Superior Court. It came out of the community of Odenac. There was a family, uh, a, a gentleman, Stéphane Deschano, who argued that had his grandmother been born male, that he would have been, and his children would have been registered as status under the Indian Act. So. Yes, there's, there was inequities in the Indian Act and in how cousins and siblings were deemed eligible for status according to the gender of grandparents. Um, he won the court case, and as a result, uh, the court struck down portions of Section 6 of the Indian Act and ordered legislative amendments to remove all of the gender inequities in the Indian Act. So Bill S-3 got royal assent in December of 2017. Uh, phase 1 was addressing cousins, siblings, and omitted minor children who weren't eligible for status under the previous amendments. They, you talked about that 6-1-A all the way so that all of the women who had lost their children and their children will all be given 6-1 status and can pass it on uh, to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And as further beyond. As well, uh, there was this phase two, which is happening right now. Federal consultations are happening across the country, um, asking First Nations people about the implementation of the 61A all the way and other registration matters, such as removal of the second generation cutoff deregistration, et cetera, which Mohawk Council denounced the collaborative process. We found that, um, you know, there's no over oversight on our part. Uh, we weren't really involved in the way the questions and the rollout uh, of this was, was happening. And we didn't necessarily want INAC officials coming into the community and presenting and talking to our people about, you know, this whole thing and what's happening. Uh, we thought it was important for us to have a Gunawage made process, which is why we brought yourself on and created a team and we've been doing engagements ever since and bringing awareness to all of these issues. What's most important though, I believe, is the demographic projections as a result of S3, which I believe you can explain. So here are the S3 demographic projections. The forecast increase could represent a five to 10 times increase of federal registrants affiliated to Gahanawage. Currently in Quebec, there's a population of 89,200 status Indians and there's a projection of 293,718 to approximately 360,000 new status Indians. Uh, the potential Gahanawage community impacts. Gahanawage could potentially face 35,000 to 65,000 new registrants that Canada will register and issue status cards that affiliate them to Gahanawage. Looking at the current demographics, there are 6,600 approximately on the Gahanawage registry. While on the federal registry, there's approximately 11,200. That's a big gap already and is only going to get bigger by the passing of Bill S3. 
So when we talk about the number of registrations as a result of S3 and the impacts to the community, we know that the vast majority of people who will be registered under this bill will have little to no current links to the community because they may have been you know, so far removed uh, living outside of the community for generations now. But despite such, uh, they will all acquire rights uh, that will have serious community implications when it comes to governance, residency, legal interests and in lands, lands claims and grievances, because in the eyes of the federal government, there will be no distinction between us who are on the KKR and anybody who's registered as a status Indian under the Indian Act. And that becomes problematic for us um, in terms of, let's say our seniory land claim grievance, if ever we were to settle that, um, any, any person who was on Canada's uh, federal list would be considered beneficiaries, I guess, and would be entitled to, whether it be monetary or land component, um, they would have a vote. They would be able to decide on, uh, you know, what agreement that we would, uh, you know, try to settle it um, and not just the KKR. And you know, for us in the community, there's been a long standing that only those people who are on the KKR make decisions. Like we talked about governance, only people could uh, vote or run for council or those who are on the KKR. So that would be a dramatic change for us. Uh, like you already talked about, the 11,200 is what's on the federal list now as opposed to the 6,600 on the KKR. That's a discrepancy of 4,500 people. Now talk about that 35 to 65,000 potential, like you said, would outnumber us tenfold and that would, that's what becomes pretty scary. So we talked about this uh, phase two of S3 and it's INAC, the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, developed this collaborative process. Now that they've passed the bill, <laughs> Now they want to consult with the First Nations people to say, okay, so how are we going to implement this 6-1-A all the way? Uh, what about the broader issues relating to Indian registration, ban membership, and First Nation citizenship, which we said uh, the, the federal government shouldn't even be talking about matters of citizenship with First Nations. That's our business to be talking about. So this timeline was announced by INAC that all last year, um, they were going to be doing these consult consultations across the country. I believe there's one that's happening in Wondage in March, uh -huh. and that's you know for this region. And then they are due to uh, have a report back to the Senate on implementation and future changes uh, to the Indian Act. So we're actually aware recently that the UN even made a, um, a decision on the discrimination that exists in the Indian Act. So we can see the writing on the wall that there will be future amendments to the Indian Act and more people will be eligible for Indian status as this moves forward. So we've denounced the process. We're not participating. Ganawaga is gonna develop our own position outside of INAC's process. And you know that's why we're, we've been engaging with the community every step of the way on this. So for the second phase of S3, there are some concerns identified by leadership to date including uh, the INAC proposal to focus on citizenship, membership, and registration is actually contrary to a nation-to-nation -nation approach. It goes against everything the two row stands for. It's also contrary to several of UNDRIP articles, so the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's contrary to the fact that nations should be able to identify their own members. There's also a fundamental need to split federal Indian registration from membership under First Nations control. The federal agenda is charter compliance. It focuses on individual rights as paramount and does not consider the resulting threat to First Nations jurisdiction or cultural erosion on our communities. And bottom line is we believe that Canada should just stay out of issues of our citizenship. So we understand that there's, this was a lot to grasp, you know, for, for us, we've been living, breathing, eating all these issues of registration, citizenship, membership, you know, we're well versed in it, but for community members hearing this for the first time, we understand that it's a lot to consume and grasp. Maybe you might not understand it, but we do have an S3 uh, website. It has a lot of information with regard to membership and residency. So we would encourage community members to go to this website. It's www gunawage.com slash s3 uh, there are a series of snapshot videos or cartoons they were done by the uh, mck communications department they're very well done and basically what it does is it gives a 
you know, little snippets of explanation about the evolution of how residency, who could live in the community, who belonged, how we identified our people over time since pre-contact, since the Indian Act and the, uh, the land surveys that were done around the community with the 1951 creation of that list. Um, you mentioned enfranchisement mm -hmm. earlier, how people were able to give up their status. Uh, the 1969 white paper, which was passed by who? Prime Minister Trudeau, the first Prime Minister Trudeau. And that some of that work is probably still trying to be continued with some of the momentum that we see today. And then talking about our community laws today, why we have a Ganyangahaga of Ganawage law, why we're proposing to have a residency law. And at the end of the day, it's taking over control and having that self-determination of our, of our future. So in terms of next steps, because we've been asked about this a lot, like what is the MCK doing about this? Uh, we already developed a, um, a letter that was sent to the Prime Minister as well as um, the Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett denouncing the collaborative process. Uh, we stated that we will not participate in this collaborative process, um, that we're embarking on our own way of doing things because that's the way we've always done things in Ganawage when it comes to these uh, issues of identity and, and belonging. Um, we already have an established membership law. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to get away from that terminology because membership does come out of the Indian Acts. So we're talking about recognition. We know in our community who's our families, who's we're lucky. been here. We're yeah, really we're a tight knit community. So for us, uh, being able to recognize who our people are, who are the Ganyangahaga of Ganawage, and ultimately moving forward, a proposed residency law. Who's allowed to live here? You know, uh, we feel that it's not the federal government sh who should have these um, decision-making powers, that it's our, our people. You know, we live here, we've grown up here. So another important component is to consider a law to control management of certificates of possession. Who could own land in the community? Because as it stands right now, anybody with a bank card uh, that says 070 can own land uh, in Ganawage. And that scares a lot of people yes. with the thinking of these new numbers of people that could be registered. So um, we know that we're going to need to work on a land management law and regime. Uh, culturally, it was the women who were in control of lands. So you know what? There's going to be a, a real serious... Um, we'll, we'll call it impetus for us as a community to, to start talking about these matters because they're really important. We have a false sense of control. Mm -hmm. And if we're really going to, uh, you know, protect ourselves for the future generations uh, as a community, we're going to have to come together on this issue. So we thank everybody for taking the time to sit through this presentation today and to learn a little bit more about Bill S3 to learn a little bit more about the distinction and the difference between uh, Indian registration and who is an Indian under the Indian Act as opposed to who is recognized as a Ganyangahaga of Ganawage or formerly a member on the membership list or the, the KKR, Ganyangahaga of Ganawage list, and then that of citizenship, which we know is the jurisdiction of the nation, the Mohawk nation, that one day, hopefully, we will be issuing, um, you know, Haudenosaunee passports, and we will recognize who our citizens are. Um, so they're they're very different in terms of identity and belonging, and this is what has been kind of imposed on us now over you know a hundred plus years that has created all this confusion. Um, so yeah, I think as a community, we're just going to have to find a way forward, and education is is the first key. So again, Yawako, I don't know if you have any final comments, Brandon, but thank you for those of you who um, took the time, as I mentioned, to sit through this, and I please check out the website, ganawage.com slash S3. There's so much more information there. We say Nyawagoa to all of you for joining us. Take care, and until next time, Anagiwahi.